Hello and welcome to episode 29 of On Books. My name is Chris and I'm recording live, well it's live right now, from the Lower East Side in New York City. We have a great show today. This week I'm bringing you So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. Have you heard of this book? It's been getting a bit of attention lately. It mainly asks the question, what do you want to do when you grow up? That's how I that's how I rephrase the question, but it's basically like what do you do with your life? What do you do with your goal? And I'm just thinking, you know, e- even now in my mid 30s, I'm like, what do I want to be when I grow up? I'm constantly asking myself this question. I'm am I happy right now? Am I happy with my job? Is there something else I want to do? I have all these passions. Oh, over and over again in my head. This book brings some clarity to that. Uh, and I come I come to you I come to you with that from a place of honesty of just like there's this constant kind of existential question that in the work I do, you know, am I affecting enough people? Am I doing a good enough job at it? Uh, it's it's hard, right? I mean, I think this has always been something throughout my career where it's been a challenge. And I really like this book because it gives me some vocabulary and some better examples. There's a lot of examples of people in this book who have similar uh, situations throughout their career and we explore how they dealt with it and the lessons learned so that I don't have to go through it. So that's all coming up and we are going to dive right into the book and the four main rules of this book. The book's divided into quatas, quatas, one, two, three, four, quatas, and I'll be bringing you all four of those. So that and much more are coming up. Stay tuned. I'm bringing you this book on On Books this week because I want you to love your work. It's not enough to just show up every day and to just get the hours and just get the paycheck at the end. It is so rewarding and so fulfilling to make part of your life and part of your mission your work. And I want to share that with you. And I want to share some of these lessons that I've learned from this book and from my own life. And hopefully you'll get something out of it. So in the next 10-ish minutes, I'm going to bring you the four rules from the book. Like I said, the book is divided into four. And I'm going to start by reading from the first few pages of the book, as I always do. And that starts with rule number one. Rule number one is don't follow your passion. Don't follow your passion. This rule is also the, a lot of times when people refer to this book, they're referring to this first uh, few, maybe 40 pages of the book, which is rule number one, don't follow your passion. And the whole idea here, uh, you know what? I'm not going to tell it to you. I'm going to start reading and then I'll explain. So let, you wait for that. You, you wait. Okay, it's coming. All right, let me just start reading and you'll get the idea. So rule number one, like I said, Don't follow your passion. It starts off, chapter one, the passion of Steve Jobs. And passion has quotes around it, as if it's saying the passion of Steve Jobs. Okay. So in this chapter, I question the validity of the passion hypothesis, which says that the key to occupational happiness is to match your job to a pre-existing passion. So let me just, to rephrase that, what he's saying is the passion hypothesis, and this is a a vocabulary word, that's the basic idea that in order to be happy and satisfied with your job, you need to follow your passion, follow your passion. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Okay. The passion hypothesis. Here we go. In June 2005, Steve Jobs took the podium at Stanford Stadium to give the commencement speech to Stanford's graduating class. Wearing jeans and sandals under his formal robe, Jobs addressed a crowd of 23,000 with a short speech that drew lessons from his life. About a third of the way into the address, Jobs offered the following advice. You've got to find what you love. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. (laughs) My Steve Jobs impersonation is also that of my Uncle Henry. Hello, I'm very stern. Continuing on. Okay. When he finished, he received a standing ovation. Though Jobs' address contained several different lessons, his emphasis on doing what you love was the clear standout. In the official press release describing the event, for example, Stanford's news service reported that Jobs urged graduates to pursue their dreams. 
soon after, an unofficial video of the address was posted on YouTube where it went viral, gathering over 3.5 million views. When Stanford posted an official video, it gathered an additional 3 million views. The comments on these clips hone in on the importance of loving your work with viewers summarizing their reactions in very similar ways. In other words, many of the millions of people who viewed this speech were excited to see Steve Jobs, a guru of iconoclast thinking, put his stamp of approval on an immensely appealing piece of popular career advice, which I call, drumroll, the passion hypothesis. Okay, so that's how the book starts. It starts with this idea that follow your passion might be terrible career advice. You don't necessarily want to follow your passion in, 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 order, in order to be successful that is with your job. And that's how the book starts off. So why, why is that? Well, the next 30 so pages go into various examples of why that is not the case. And I'm going to summarize one of the main ones, which I really like, and this is called the science of passion, the idea that career passions are rare, okay? The main idea here is that if everyone followed their passion, we would have a everyone would just basically be a dancer or an actor or a professional reader right they do this there was a study in 2002 this is in the book here there was a study by a canadian university and they asked it was a questionnaire where they asked the students about 500 students they asked them do you have a passion and if so what are they okay do you have a passion and the results came back from the students and it showed that 84% of the students surveyed were identified as having a passion. Oh, thank God. But what were they passionate about? Well, this is where I tell you the, the, the truth of what kids are passionate about. Are you ready? This gets dirty. Cover your ears. Ready? Don't cover your ears. Cover your ears. Okay. Here are the top five identified passions. Dancing. Hockey. Remember, this is a Canadian study. Skiing, reading, and swimming. The thing, the problem with this is that these passions don't have much to offer when it comes to choosing a job, says Cal Newport. In fact, less than 4% of the total identified passions had any relation to work or education, with the remaining 96% describing hobby style interests such as sports and art. So if you're listening now and you're wondering, well, if follow your passion is not good advice, then what is good advice? This book would suggest that the best way to find satisfaction at your job is to first master a subject, to first find skills that you're good at, and then we can over time apply them. Passion takes time. It doesn't just happen immediately and then you go find a job to match your passion. First you find your skills and your, your mastery and the side effect of that is your passion and you are in luck listening right now because rule number two will tell you exactly how you can find your skills it is called rule number two and it is the title of the book be so good they can't ignore you So, rule number two, be so good they can't ignore you. In the first rule, I explained that follow your passion is bad advice. <laughs> oh, tongue twister. Uh, well, what is good advice? Good advice would be to be so good they can't ignore you, which means taking on the craftsman mindset. Essentially, what you're doing is focusing on what value you can provide for your job. Whereas the passion mindset, from rule number one, focuses on what can the world offer me? I'm really passionate about music. I want to be a musician. Where can I get a job in that? And we talked about how that's not necessarily the best way to go about things. Well, the craftsman mindset focuses on what can I offer the world, right? So be so good they can't ignore you. Be so good at some kind of craft. Find your niche in, if it is music, Find that and explore it so that people can't ignore you, so that you're the best in that. You have to prove yourself with some kind of career capital, which is what we'll talk about in a bit, something that is so unique and valuable that people can't, uh, can't ignore you. Well, I can't, I can't say it any, any better. <laughs> uh, this quote comes from comedian Steve Martin. So he says in the book, he says, nobody ever takes my advice because it's not the answers they want to hear. What they want to hear is, here's how you get an agent, here's how you get a script, but I always say, 
be so good they can't ignore you. And he was referring to uh, his book, Born Standing Up, when he was, he, and it's a memoir that talks about his rise in the comedy scene, which is also oh, such a great book. I, I listened to the audiobook. He reads it. It's amazing. So Born Standing Up, the, in this book, he talks about the way that comedy was when he got started. He was only 20 years old, Steve Martin, when he decided to innovate on his comedy routine because at the time comedy was just this whole set up and punchline set up and punchline it was it was getting fairly cliche and Steve Martin thought well what if I could do something a bit more sophisticated and so the way he explains it is he said well what if there were no punchlines what if there were no indicators that a joke was coming up what if I created tension and never released it what if I had it for a climax but all I delivered was an anti-climax so he was really pushing the boundaries of his routine at the time. And here you could see that he was starting to craft a niche and doing something that would just be so outstanding that he was making his own space. The Steve Martin story, and really this whole second rule of be so good they can't ignore you, it reminds me of the advice that my ex-girlfriend would give anyone who wanted a book deal. She is, uh, I would quote her, she used to say, she's responsible for making people's dreams come true because <laughs> She's a book publicist, publicist, and people would pitch her books, and she would be the one deciding if it got made or not. And what she looked for when people came to write books, and everybody has a book. If you were a family member of hers, you were lucky enough to have her. You you would get past the first barrier, and she would she would look at the the transcript or the you know the first version of it. Um, but for most every other person, you would have to submit it, and whether she would even read it or not would be based on do you have a platform. So this is really, really uh, a common hurdle that you have to overcome if you want to get a book published by, you know, a large kind of penguin style, like very large book publishing company. And so what do I mean by a platform? Well, that basically means that you've carved out a niche. Maybe you have an email list already, right, of people that are already subscribed. Maybe you have a, a large Twitter following. Maybe you've already published something on your own or you're, you know, you've, carved out you're so good they can't ignore you with your speaking career it means having something already and doing some work so that when you come and somebody's going to lift you up and give you a book deal you have something to stand on you have a platform so that's what it's about and that is uh, also very similar to this advice that steve martin is giving and it really echoes throughout a lot of the stories of the craftsman mindset in this chapter be so good they can't ignore you by that, it means having skills that are rare and valuable to the working world. And that is the key to creating work that you love. And Cal Newport, he has a word for that. It's called career capital. Career capital, your rare and valuable skill that you can offer the world that will help you find, eventually find work that you will become passionate about. That is what this is all about, career capital. All right. Rule number three, turn down a promotion. This chapter or this rule is about the importance of control. The main idea here is that having control of your job is one of the highest achievements that you can have. So what, what does he mean by control? Having autonomy in decisions of when you work, how you work, who you work with, having control over your career and how your career fits into your lifestyle. That is is one of the dream elixirs of having a satisfying career is what he's found. Okay. So this chapter, what he means by turning down a promotion is basically, and I don't totally, totally, totally agree, but the idea 
the idea is, is fairly simple. The idea is that there's certain traps of control that you want to avoid. So if you get a promotion too early and you are going to fail at that thing, that could be bad is basically the idea. So for instance, there's a story here uh, of a woman who drops out of college to start a business and the business fails. And the lesson of control there is that she went into that situation without enough career capital. She didn't have the, va the skills to offer the market when she went to try to find investment for her company uh, from VCs or angels or some kind of investors. She wasn't able to back it up by being able to say that she could perform. So that's the idea is that sometimes you have to build up well, according to the book, all the time. You want to build up that career capital. You want to be able to have a foundation or a platform to stand on before you jump into the big end, the deep end, because you'll get eaten up by sharks. This actually reminds me of some advice that I heard recently. Uh, I think BJ Novak, he was on the Tim Ferriss podcast, and I really love, there was a great quote from him where he said, there's two things that you should do when you are trying to launch your career, and this was when he was in college, Right before he started to write for The Office, he was one of the actors and writers in the American office. He said that you want to have something, number one, you want to have something that gets people's attention. And number two, when you get their attention, you need to back it up. So that, that number two part here is, you know, building a platform, having some foundation. I think mean, uh, another example of this same thing would be that if you have a YouTube channel and you have a, one video that gets 10 million views, right? If you have one video that gets 10 million views and people come to your page and you don't have any other videos, well, they're likely not going to subscribe or remember who you are. But if on the other hand, you consistently put out videos and you have, you know, maybe 10 or 20 videos, when that one video gets a million hits, they might go to your page and go, oh, this person has a lot of content here. You know, and they'll watch a few other things you have. You'll get hits on those and maybe they'll even subscribe to your channel, which would be the goal because then they are coming back and, and knowing who you are and you're building trust. So, again, that is kind of the difference between this here. You know, you, you, you want to build a foundation. And then when you dive in the deep end, when you get a promotion or where you have some big opportunity, you have something to back it up. Career capital. Okay, finally, rule number four, think small, act big. The main idea here is you need to have a mission in life. Basically, the rule says that having a unifying mission of your work makes for greater satisfaction. So stepping back for a second, the thing that I really love about this book is this idea of mission. It really brings together all of this that we've been talking about from passion to having valuable skills and career capital. If you have a mission in your life, then the day-to-day, -day, the, the days that are monotonous, the days that are early in your career when you're not quite sure what you should be doing or you're not quite sure you know, if it adds up, that's how you can unify all of those doubts because you can be a janitor at a hospital, for example, and you may be able to rationalize, hey, you know, I, the day to day, this isn't necessarily what I'm super passionate or excited about, but you can see the larger idea of being on a path towards something or that you're contributing. Maybe you'll just be, you know, the janitor at the hospital for your entire life, but be able to rationalize that you were part of, you know, contributing to that system, which is, yes, you are actually contributing to that. It's just all how you rationalize it and all how you interpret that in your mind. So that is a really cool way to frame it. Now, it may you may not know what your mission in life is. I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. That's fine. This book goes into some stories that inspire you to, to think about that into uh, you know, different ways that you can start to construct your mission. Building on this, I put it out there that my mission is something along the lines of making education more a part of our daily lives, something fun, something that's more approachable, something that is, is more accessible. And the ways that I've gone about doing that are through a variety of different projects. 
And this is what the book calls little bets. And I really like this idea. So if you're out there thinking, you know, what is my mission and how do I know if I'm getting close to it? The little bets that I make have been things like this podcast. You know, this in a way is related to taking these ideas that I believe are trapped in books, these great nuggets and kernels of ideas and and retelling those stories in different ways to bring that to you in an audio quick free format so that would be one way of of sharing education in a more accessible way another way is that i've i've taught at universities that's clearly teaching and bringing my style to that another would be making youtube videos another would be starting the company one month which is an education company so from a distance you may see all these things and and it may be like, well, there's a lot of different projects out there. You know, maybe you don't see the unifying, you know, thread, and that's fine. Uh, I would encourage you, and, and this book encourages you to try a lot of different things. the The passion hypothesis here set, you know, is, is really along the lines of there is this one thing. I need to work at this university. I need to do this one thing. I need to be an actor. But if you try a lot of different things along the way you can kind of go back and forth in finding your place. Which brings me to my final point, which is the thing I don't love about this book, which is what we started with, the passion hypothesis. I think it makes sense when we're talking about our careers. Yes, if you are going to go out there and say, I want to be a hockey player, there can only be so many hockey players. But what about the people that actually do become hockey players? There should be a place for what I would consider art. There should be a place for doing something that you love and pursuing it with your heart and just putting it out there regardless of whether there's a job waiting for you at the end of that. So that would be my plea is just to to put time in your life to follow those things that you are passionate about with the caveat that Cal Newport brings up, which is yeah, it may not necessarily lead to a satisfying career. So that does make sense. You know, again, there's only so many hockey players out there. But I'll share a bit of my own experience. Which I started with a passion career. I was a music major. And then I realized, hey, probably not going to make money for my entire life just playing music. But I still love music. So I still, to this day, play music, you know, constantly. I love music. Also, my passion and my mission for education, that came from me leaving my career when I was 25. I just wanted to get the hell out of New York City and travel. I wanted to explore the world. So I went to Japan and I took a job teaching. And I didn't know anything about it. It was very, very foreign. I mean, obviously being in a different country, but even teaching was something totally new to me. It was just something I wanted to try and kind of putting myself into that, just being passionate about it, not getting paid that much to teach out there, allowed me to realize something that I was good at and connect with that and then find career capital and value in that, you know, 10 years later where I am now. So I think yes, 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 yes. And make it your own, I think is where I would leave things off. You know, there's two types of people that you can be. Uh, there's a generalist out there and a specialist, I really, I am the generalist. You know, I am the person who I think I would rather live a life living 10 different lives, you know, having taught English in Japan and having gotten paid as, as a music journalist a few years ago and then having a podcast or whatever. Like these are just fun, exciting things that I, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter if it all adds up to my career. And yeah, maybe my career actually won't be as successful as it could be if I picked one thing. So that's something I, you know, go back and forth about, but it's also something that I'm just really passionate and enjoy doing. Uh, so that's where I'm at. You know, that's where I get torn with this passion hypothesis, but I do really love the book for putting a word to it, putting some vocabulary to it and helping focus so that you can get to that mission, which is really the heart of this book. So good they can't ignore you. There's so much more in here uh, that I wasn't able to cover, which are stories that go along with each of these rules. Uh, lots of inspiring stories from Derek Sivers, Steve Jobs, and a slew of other people. Wonderful stories that are worth reading and really kind of illustrate these points. 
Thank you for listening to On Books. My name is Chris, and you can subscribe on iTunes. I'll put a new book out every week so that you can get in 52 new books this year, whether you've read them uh, before or this is your first time. I'll give you the main kernel of knowledge from the book and hopefully get you amped to read it if it's something that excites you. So the book notes, I put out book notes for each of these books. You can find those at my website, on-books.com. You can follow me. I'm on Twitter at onbookshow. I'm on Facebook forward slash onbookshow. Email me if you have anything you'd like to add, any comments, anything you, you love the show, you hate the show. Let me know what you're thinking. I'm Chris at on-books.com. And I'm going to leave you with some some of my passion, some of my music. This is a song. I found this yesterday. I wrote this song years ago. And I, I recorded this on an iPhone in my music studio when I was playing. And no one has ever heard it before. And I figured, why not share it? It's a song that I wrote. This is me singing and playing music with my friend Kyle. This song is called Something Is Happening. And it's by my band, Birdstar. So check that out. And I will see you next week. Enjoy. Yes.